Hello and welcome. This is IoT Builders, a live stream where we discuss a range of topics on the Internet of Things, from embedded devices to cloud services, all from an IoT Builder perspective. This is episode five, and today we have Mark Sear joining us uh, from IoT Plus Network, and uh, he's here to share some of his insights and perspectives. My name is Dan Gross. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS, working on FreeRTOS and AWS IoT. I'm joined by uh, my colleagues this morning, uh, at least it's morning where I am, uh, Ninad and Alina. Hey, Alina, how's it going? Hi, Dan. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, really happy that you could join us today on IoT Builders. Uh, my name is Alina. Um, I'm a senior developer advocate for AWS IoT for consumer and connectivity. And uh, yeah, Nenad, would you like to introduce yourself too? Sure. So, hi, everybody. I'm Nenad Ilich. I'm a senior developer advocate uh, for AWS IoT as well as my colleagues here. So, yeah, uh, I think we still are waiting for Mark uh, to, to join. Okay. Yeah. It looks like Mark hasn't uh, joined just yet. He might be having some technical difficulties here, but, um, but we are also joined by Syed. Hi, Syed. How are you doing? Hi, Dan. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Syed. Uh, I'm just like the rest of my colleagues, uh, I'm a developer advocate, and happy to have you guys join us. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So as we uh, work to get Mark on, um, online here, um, oh, actually, that's him right now. So let me uh, let me invite him. Hey, Mark. Let's see. I think he's he's on. Hey, Mark, are you there? So as, as always, we have, <laughs> you know, people joining and then having issues at the very beginnings of like, okay, how do I connect to Twitter spaces? How I unmute myself, <laughs> how, how I become a speaker, all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yep. I guess. Yep. If you can hear us, Mark, um, I'm inviting you to speak, so you might need to accept that. There we go. I see Mark is now a speaker. Um, is your is your mic working, yep. Mark? Everything's good now. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, it's always a little uh, <laughs> a little bit of a rocky start here uh, with. Uh, with getting mics and headphones and everything all set up, right? Okay. Hey, uh, Mark, so why don't you introduce yourself? Um, thanks for joining us on IoT Builders. Really appreciate it. Um, Great to be uh, Yeah, go ahead. Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm coming from, you know, the, the technology space in IoT before it had the name IoT. Um, reverse engineering, you know, RS-45 serial from Honeywell alarm boxes back in back in the day. And they didn't call it IoT then, but but now they do. And, you know, my my experiences are coming from various places. I'm, I'm sort of a generalist coming from product engineering background with Cisco Systems, getting to product management, a lot of project management across the space, um, agile coaching and, and a variety of other things, including um, professional services. And now I'm, you know, I'm volunteering with an organization called IoT Plus Network, and we're 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 taking the idea of how to approach IoT from a network and community perspective. Oh, that's fantastic! Uh, tell us more about that. Um, you know, what what is IoT Plus Network, and um, you know, what would you like to tell people about? You know, possibly joining or contributing. 
Yeah, so IoT Plus Network is basically it started from this this organization in Germany called DE Hub, which is very tied to the Ministry of Economics and Climate Action, and they basically fund activities and make life easier for people who want innovation to happen in Germany. And the idea is to do it from grassroots. So rather than you know corporate interests getting in the way and polluting things, uh, maybe standards and other things. Uh, you know, really coming from the ground up and getting people together who are doing IoT every day, getting the business people, the technical people, the investors, people from all places in IoT together to network and further the the whole everything about IoT. That's awesome. Uh, so you mentioned standard. So you're you're joining us from Germany, right? You're you're in Berlin. As well yeah. as uh, as well as Nenad and Alina, so we've got the uh, Berlin contingent represented. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's great. Different. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it's great to be in uh, an organization that's also globally spanning. I mean, we've started off in Germany, and Berlin was our major presence. We're obviously expanding to, to other areas in Germany first, and then expanding to a wider area like USA and other areas as well. But it's just super cool to get connected with people across the globe and, and everywhere. I mean, IoT is, is like that. It's, it's, it's somehow yet still a small world, even though it's global. Yeah, it seems so. Every time, um, you know, we visit different conferences like Embedded World or uh, Hanover Messe, uh, you run into a lot of the same people. So it seems like IoT, um, you know, has a, a certain attraction for uh, for a, a group of folks that, uh, uh, you know, we always seem to run into, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm here to talk about, the main thing is there's a few themes that I've noticed in my experience and background since I've been in IoT. Uh, just a few themes, but each of them deserves a little bit of, of speaking points about. Uh, the first is that uh, data is a liability and not an asset. That's a bit, it's a bit uh, maybe the opposite of what everyone else is talking about these days. And I, I, Dan, you were, you, you were mentioning yeah. you send everything to the cloud, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a bit controversial, right? Data as a liability, because we, uh, you know, we always hear that uh, data is your most valuable uh, commodity, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think when we think about data, I think we need to introduce a few different definitions. And I think we need to understand what data is. And, and data is a, a liability. If you think about it, you have to, it's like a house mortgage, you know, you've got a You've got bills to pay and you have no income coming in from this data necessarily when you start off. You have to transport data, you have to transform data, you have to store it, you have to secure it, all of these things. And you've, you've got no income coming in from that. So the new definition I think we need to be aware of is insights. You know, you need to generate insights mm. about data. And I think differentiating between these two things is very helpful. And I think, you know, that mindset is the challenge is data send it to the cloud and data 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 i think we need to overcome that somehow and i think one of the ways that we can do that is knowledge sharing getting together having the edge people talk to the cloud people having the business people talk to the tech people and really getting those things uh you know getting those conversations out there oh and that's what's great about the iot plus network uh is, is building a community around that right to uh exactly to, to yeah. cover different topics um I think, uh, you know, standards, you've, you've mentioned standards uh, before. So, you know, how, how do we how do we uh, coalesce on different, uh, you know, different um, standards to, to make things easier for everyone? Right. Yeah, that's that's a great example. Standards, uh, you know, in particular, if you look at what's happening in LoRa, the, the you know, wide area network uh, space there, you have these simple things. These devices need to be encoded and they need to be decoded. And yet there is no one way to do it. And it's oftentimes it's limited because of hardware capacity or, you know, the manufacturer just chooses to do it a certain way. And this makes it really challenging for the people who are interacting with those and trying to implement those in solutions. And if you come from the mindsets of the, you know, Standards must be created by these big organizations, the, the, the big ones like Siemens and, uh, and others out there. 
you know, you end up with potential conflicts of interests about these standards, how they're created. And it really needs to come from the grassroots ground up. And I, 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 you know, I really think that that's the best way to approach these standards. And I think Dan, you had a joke about, about standards. <laughs> yeah. The great thing uh, about standards is that there's so many to choose from, um, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> which isn't necessarily complimentary of standards, but, um, but yeah, no, I think that uh, it's absolutely true that um, it's, it, you know, when you're with something like Laura, uh, which is a standard, uh, but, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, protocols like that maybe don't even go far enough. And there's, uh, there's practices that uh, people in the field uh, are doing, you know, developers, uh, people building solutions, systems uh, that... Uh, you know, they, they have certain practices that they're, you know, they find, uh, you know, valuable or helpful in, in building these systems. And, and why not? Why, you know, why not have uh, standards around how we do things? It makes everyone's life easier. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, another theme that we talk about um, as we see IoT unfolding, and again, it's a little bit uh, controversial, but... Um, you know, you have this, your competitor is your, your best partner that you don't have yet. And I'm skipping around. I know we, we had a couple other topics we want to talk about. I have mine a little bit out of order here, but your competitor is your best partner you don't have yet. What do I mean <laughs> by that? You know, in this space, there's a lot of companies out there, you know, it's us against the world. We must do everything ourselves. We have to uh, figure out how to, how to do it. Or maybe we're taking on too much and, there are other partners who have that capability. And the thing is, if you go to a competitor, I was just at the Hanover Messe just, just the other uh, month in June here in Berlin. And there was this uh, competitor of, of ours at, at the current company I work for, Weave. And I approached them. And as it turns out, we're now partners because we approached the situation from, hey, what are you doing from a technical perspective? And how do you approach the business? And as it turns out, our tech was pretty much the same, but we had a totally different audience with a different model for business side. And so there's room for partnership there. And I think we have to rethink how we approach IoT. It's so vast. There's so many things going on. There's so many components that you need to partner into success. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is definitely a key point. Uh, because if you look at the stack needed to deliver an IoT product, like there are so many things and different expertise are already available, um, you know, on the market. Uh, and if you don't partner uh, with, you know, uh, people who are producing PCBs, who are developing hardware, uh, people who are working in the cloud, and if you don't have that, uh, you know, network of people and, and partnership, uh, then, you know, there is a low probability that you will release something that's uh, meaningful for the end user. So, yeah. And I, and I see that happening all the time with the usage of Amazon services, Azure services, where you have CTOs that are making make-buy decisions. And for example, they might make their own, I don't know, um, role-based system or user management when there are existing things. And I think even sometimes people, even though they're trying to stay up to date and aware of everything that's happening, sometimes they're just not aware uh, of the possibilities that are out there. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's challenging. But again, I think, I think the answer comes down to networking because at the end of the day, um, you know, some, some folks release products that aren't great. Some folks release products that aren't tried in the market. But for sure, you're going to hear about it from your, your, your network, which ones are working well. So, you, you know, I think that's one of the ways you can get ahead in this space. Even if you're in a technical setting and maybe you don't like big events like the Hanover Mesa, but, you know, I'm running an event and I intentionally run an event that's very small. It's super informal. It's intimate. It's, I try to keep it between six and ten people just so that you can make sure you get people to open up and really share their experiences. It's interesting. Um, actually, Mark, I wanted to ask you, do you have an example from, uh, you know, from your career so far where actually your competitor became your partner? An example that you could give us of that working out? 
Yes, there are there are so many. I mean, so I mentioned um, Weave with TT Tech. I didn't mention TT Tech, but that's that's one partner with others too. So we, I, I went to Hanover Messe, same same fair. I had the same pitch. I went partner to partner, and Siemens Mindsphere on the surface looks like a competitor to what we're doing at Weave, and they're basically data acquisition into dashboards. I mean, at the end of the day, getting getting data from IoT into the cloud to do something. That's meaningful and interesting with it. And again, this was another partner pitch where we said, listen, listen, maybe we do business differently. Maybe our tech stack is different. And as it turns out, our tech stack is totally different. And they gave us referrals to three different partners. So we, we ended up with that one referral with three more referral partners, of which two became actual partners. Um, and it's just, it, it multiplies like that. And there are so many examples um, and I can I can think of of a time where I was working with with another company, and we had this sort of yeah the wrong mindset. We had this hardware mechanical mindset with traditional uh, competitors, traditional sales channels, traditional you know your your competitors, your competitors, and they have been for the last twenty years. But in the new space in IoT, once these companies go digital, you know. Every one of these companies is taking it from a different angle. And that slightly different angle affords you the ability to find if there's opportunities for partnership, even with these long-time competitors. And we had exactly one of these when I was working at Dan Foss. This is public information. Uh, Dan Foss and Palfinger. Palfinger is, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not competitors. They're actually uh, partners already, but they were competing in a certain space in IoT and telematics, and they decided to partner into it, and they, they have a better relationship in the long term as a result of that. Yeah, and th this seems like a, um, a pattern with, with IoT because um, IoT has so many different uh, layers or aspects. Um, you know, there's, there's really a, a, quite a range of solutions there that, you know, you can, you can kind of cherry pick in a way. And, you know, I think if, if, um, you know, if these solution providers uh, focus on the things that they're good at, that, um, you, you know, you, you can end up putting together a, a very good system, right? Um, whereas, you know, tr trying to get a sort of single vendor, um, you know, uh, solution, sometimes, you know, pieces of that aren't, aren't, aren't the best or aren't, you know, um, you know, suitable to, to, to scaling or to, you know, your specific, uh, your specific needs, that sort of thing. So, um, it seems like a, it seems like this is, I don't know that this is unique to IOT, but it seems like it's, uh, definitely, um, more widespread in IOT. Would, would, would you agree with that? Exactly, because because it, it's it's a unique it's a non unique principle in business, but it's it's even more uh, amplified in IoT mm. because the stack is so long from mm. going down yeah. to the field hardware, the edge hardware, the firmware, the software, the applications, and then the user interface and infrastructure and everything in between. There's very few cases in business where you have to care about all of those things and i think that just amplifies the the challenges yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's like you know it's like a band you, you need to orchestrate all of that beautifully uh in synchronous in order to you know have that great product and if one thing is out of place the customer will notice uh, the end customer will notice like oh this is out of place and then they can just quickly run away from it so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly. Nedad, you're, you're reminding me. So we were we were talking about um, consumer IoT and business IoT, and they're, they're you know they're both they're the same but different. Um, but it's going on the other another theme of of that I'm bringing here today, which is the business mm. and, and technical divide. Oh, so yeah, I'll just right. frame it frame it a little bit. So yeah, business and technical divide. What you end up with is the business folks. They like to they tend to oversimplify and the technical folks, they tend to overcomplicate and take this and amplify IOT. And you have obviously a recipe for a lot of challenges. And in particular, you know, you could take data quality as an example. So if you wanted to get um, the definition of data quality from a business person, it's really simple. It's, are you measuring the right thing and to the right extent to provide the outcome that I'm looking for? 
And in the technical side, it's more like, did you measure it to the, the grade of correctness, accuracy? Was it filtered correctly? Was it error-free? Did it not have false positive or negatives? And now I'll give you a, a practical example. So let's say that I want to have a thermostat and I want to, a LoRa connected thermostat and I want to grab some, some temperature data and do something interesting with it. Well, the, the business mind might say, oh, all I need is temperature. All right. So if you then start designing something around, okay, I need it to make this thing for temperature. As it turns out, many thermostats that we use today that are standard features in the market also have a cold air sensor, which is detecting whether or not a window is open or closed. And there's certain logic and you know and, and technical details behind that. But if you if you approach the situation from the business side, you say we just need temperature. But then you neglect to realize, actually, you might need humidity, you might need a cold air sensor, you might need all these different things in order to provide that fantastic experience that, as Nenad, as you were saying, needs to just work from that whole stack all the way from the sensor all the way to the cloud. And that's, that's challenging. That is definitely challenging. So what would you say would be uh, ways to, to actually overcome this divide I and mean, to find some pragmatic uh, you know, way in the middle. So for me, the easiest is to get the people together and discuss. So I think when you're working in your own company and you're talking, you know, in your own, you know, divisions, you know, even if you're in a startup, it doesn't really make a difference. At some point, you you come up with these natural barriers to other oh, business guy, other oh, tech guy. And I think what you really need to do is talk to other people that are business or tech, the opposite of what you are outside of your company because when you start hearing the same things over and over again but from a third party you start to to understand and you start to gain better perspective of what the situation is and and again with this with this simple thermostat example i mean if if the business person went to the meetup and talked to some folks that were talking about technology and oh yeah it's obvious that the common common knowledge that it has to be done with xyz I think these types of things would open up the eyes a little bit, but also on the flip side, the the technical people they love to overcomplicate and sort of a sort of call it a defense mechanism that engineers have is if I don't know exactly what I need to build, I will build it so it can handle everything, right? <laughs> highly configurable. <laughs> but yeah. as it turns out, that that highly oh, yeah. configurable. Uh, experience is not necessarily good right especially if you're a consumer you open something out of the box you want it to work you don't want to set this thing and put that parameter in and adjust this thing and you know 10 steps later you've given up on the damn thing <laughs> <laughs> well and that kind of goes back to your data as a liability point right and, and unless you're pretty clear about what you're doing with the data and how you're adding uh some kind of value uh to the to the user, um, it it is uh, essentially just a liability uh, until until you turn it into an asset, right? Um, yeah, exactly, and and that flows really nicely with with the, the the fourth point that I bring here, and final point really is customers don't care about IoT. They just don't. And the best IoT is invisible to them. And I, I think that's that's like a, a shot to the gut for people who've been working in IoT as long as we have. But it's true. Uh, you know, customers want their their problems solved. They don't they don't want to know. Oh, isn't that cool? Or isn't that? Oh my goodness! How did you make that happen? That's that's magic. It, maybe they do for for you know the first day or two, but for the most part, it, it needs to work. Your thermostat in your house it it needs to work. If it's connected to the internet. And it's not working because your app is broken or you have a bug somewhere. Or if you have, I know NetEd has, a, has an experience with his, with his doorbell. You know, it, your experience just needs to work, period. And it needs to provide value to you. It can't just be a bells and whistles convenience feature. It really needs to do something for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing is, you mentioned this. It's like I have this issue where if somebody rings a bell... Uh, I have a no physical button to open the door uh, of of my uh, house, so I need to do it through an application. <laughs> so yeah, it happens a couple of times that the application freezes and and so forth. 
And sometimes, uh, I think I mentioned this before, sometimes people don't know like how to ring a bell. They call me on my phone and I say, okay, we need to hang up. You need to press that button, call me, and then I can open because in my application, there is no way to open the door if nobody rings. So yeah, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Which is, of course, <laughs> how, how a doorbell normally works, right? That's how yeah, your, your exactly. doorbell but But when you put it in an app, it, it, the experience is different and it, it ruins it somehow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is something I think, you know, product builders need to be real careful about is, you know, getting the getting the user experience right. Um, I mean, nobody buys a an IoT product, right? Like you were saying, nobody goes out and says, I'm going to buy some some IoT today. Um, you know, you, you, you really buy a product with a purpose in mind. And, and so that purpose has to be, um, you know, fulfilled, right? And th it, that reminds me of, if you look at all of the positioning, the marketing positioning of all of the consumer IoT products that are highly successful on the market right now, they, they don't mention IoT. Uh, Fitbit, that's, that's, that's IoT. E-scooters, that's IoT. Amazon Echo Dash, Google Home. Even uh, you know Nintendo has their um, a Switch. That's technically IoT as well. These are all platforms that are delivering value that have no mention of IoT in it. And it's about their positioning the market. They're they're solving a problem. Nintendo's solving your entertainment needs. Amazon's solving your you know your convenience needs of ordering. And you know you don't want to switch contexts. Context. You want to be in the living room and order the thing when you see it instead of next day going on your computer and trying to remember right and that's what they're doing they're they're solving that problem uh, but not not with iot they're solving the problem the customer's problem yeah the underlying technology might be using iot but yeah it's at the end a specific problem that doesn't relate to it yeah but also in the context context of the industrial i think there more than ever you have different themes with different expertise that they need to talk to each other, uh, you know, to in order to deliver uh, whatever needs to be delivered. That in insight, as you said, like that asset, actually, not the data, but the asset, uh, which is the insight, right? So in that scenario, you also need to have, uh, you know, people on the shop floor who are familiar with the uh, machinery and then, you know, uh, people who can... Uh, still comply with the security, but able to extract that data. Um, and then, you know, people who actually know what that data means, like how, the, how is it modeled? Uh, so, and then <laughs> on top of that, create those insights to whoever needs to use them in order to make decisions, right? So <laughs> even yeah, there, you it, need to create a community, yeah? It, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned the, the industrial side. There's, there's a... Um, a thing called the MES. It's a manufacturing execution system. It essentially attempts to connect the various systems and subsystems together so that it be the information can become available to other systems like uh, mm -hmm. you know SAP and these other kind of business systems. But the reality is, if you look at the market, first of all, that's very expensive software. There's a huge market that does not have, they're, they're making the make-buy decision. They say, we can't afford it. But if you can afford it, if you're big enough to afford it, you have at your fingertips, theoretically, the ability to do a lot of this stuff. You might need to retrofit. You might need to do a bunch of work on the IoT side in order to get access of the data to make insights. But let's say you have all of that. Even then, the education problem, you usually only have one or two qualified personal staff. They, mm. they oftentimes are not they're like, don't touch it. It works, right? So you, you're making a request to make a change. No, no, no. Don't touch it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's it's really challenging. The, the barriers that the industry itself puts in front of itself in order to protect itself from, um, you know, it's, it's main bread and butter, which is this thing is working. I don't want to touch it. If it's, don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Yeah, yeah. I, re I remember this, I just have to mention it. So we were in a similar scenario and then we were doing some calculations on the edge um, and there was some question posed like, why don't you do this in the PLC? Because it makes sense, you, you need it real time and all that stuff um, in order to kind of execute certain uh, um, uh, changes and so forth. Uh, and the answer was like, yeah, we can do it in PLC, but 
it will take us three years to kind of change exactly. that framework. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's totally the the the, the current scenario in the industrial right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're just joining us, uh, this is IoT Builders, and um, it's episode five, and we have Mark Sear joining us from IoT Plus Network, and um, and we've covered a, a few topics already. Uh, we learned that data is a liability, not an asset, which um, uh, sounds a bit controversial, but uh, uh, we also talked a little bit about the business and technology divide. Um, and what uh, what else what else are some of our themes here, uh, Mark? So yeah, I mean there are sub themes. I think if you if you take the business technical divide, I think it's really where a lot of things start, and um, it kind of goes from there. And I, I'll give you an example. So we talked about um, data quality, but there's other other themes in IoT. Uh, a, a word we hear often is predictive maintenance, and I will go on record and say for the most part, not for everyone, but for the most part, maybe 80%, this is a buzzword and it doesn't carry a lot of um, knowledge, whether it be organizational knowledge or know-how or, you know, partnerships, missing partnerships uh, to make that happen. And in particular, if you have IoT data and you're trying to do something with predictive maintenance, you have to understand that the, the tech folks understand that this is not going to happen overnight. There's, there's all this data that we need and we need to, you know, uh, make this happen. But even if you have an idea about what you're doing in, in the predictive maintenance uh, segment, let's say you need these two or three or four values. What happens is when you go to actually train the model and use it, you don't even know yet that you're missing a parameter. If you're just doing a classic linear uh, optimization or something like that, let's say you needed temperature, humidity, pressure, and you didn't even realize it, but you also needed to have a, a counter of the number of times an event happened or something. You don't know it. And so that's not a parameter. So your model is off. And so it's, it's really challenging in particular because I think organizations need to learn that they need to have this staff on hand. If they really want to go into this area of predictive maintenance, predictive analytics, and IoT, they need to have some subject matter expertise in-house. And you can use a leverage model, of course, but you do need that in-house. And I see so many times that there are companies, they're throwing around these buzzwords, and they don't even have a data scientist on board. Oh, why? why? We could just pay a data scientist. Okay, but you know that's not that's not how it works. You have to train the model. You have to do. All, there's all these steps. You have to learn. It takes a, a year and a half, maybe even in some cases, to do this learning. And those are that's that's IP. That's intellectual property. You don't want to outsource that. But can, can I just buy predictive maintenance? Or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these things take a lot of iterations, you know. It's uh it's kind of uh engineering by iteration uh oftentimes and you know really spending spending the time on you know these bespoke uh you know types of systems. Um you know isn't isn't really just waving a magic wand, right? Um you know, you actually have to invest the the time and energy into it. And I think that's one of the challenges is the biz says, let's do this, let's go. Maybe there's a business case. And, you know, if you start off with the, the less mat mature mindset, like um, actually right now I'm in the middle of writing a collaborative piece, a white paper, um, IoT maturity model. There exists data maturity models already. They're out there. But there are additional considerations that you need to worry about and make sure you have checked off uh, before you're you know, getting too far ahead. And I think if you take the companies that are just getting into digitalization now, and maybe they're a lower maturity level, um, they think that you can just spend money, right? And then maybe even some of them know three, four years from now, we can have outcomes. But I think it's, it's a problem because you develop the business case. But then you actually go down the rabbit hole and you find out, oh, yeah, that's that's not what we thought it was. I was working with, with one company, I won't mention the name, but they were trying to build an IoT platform 
within their, uh, you know, their producing machines essentially for manufacturers. And they, they tried to build their own IoT platform. They got about three years in, their budget got pulled and they backed out of it entirely. And they said, and I think you'll like this one, Dan, because you're in the real-time operating system side. They said, we didn't realize how hard closed loop control feedback would be. Which oh. is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a trivial piece. It's a big, big thing. And they couldn't do it. Three years with a ton of money, not enough. Not enough resources, not enough time. Yeah, sometimes the best laid plans, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, get, get uh, a little sidetracked when, you know, things don't work or the sensors that you expect um, to work a certain way work a, maybe a totally different way. And now you have to really figure out what that means. Um, you know, I remember working on some, you know, weather, uh, weather station data and, you know, figuring out how wind speed and um, wind direction and things like that work with these these sensors. It's not just uh, one reading. It's, uh, you know, taking many readings and figuring out, you know, maybe averages or things like that. And um, it, it ends up taking time. Um, and th that's even a simple example, right? Uh, yeah. Applying filters, yeah. Filters, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah but it's interesting, yeah, it's, like, you... You also come from this um, kind of like agile coaching perspective, and and talk about like the 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 network and the different departments. I found this exercise like really useful with this like how might we questions where you bring different expertise uh, and, uh, from the technical perspective, but also like product, business, and so forth in one room, and then you kind of like just pass them with. You know, whatever comes to their mind uh, in regards to specific projects uh, with like this, how might we questions? And then everybody comes and then talks about like, oh, but we have this detail. I have no clue like how to resolve it. And then the product comes and they say this and that they say that and so forth. And then you kind of circle out and say like most of the stuff that you have problems with are not relevant or some of it is relevant and so forth. And then you come like with a big story about like how, uh, you know, this needs to be developed. I found that to be really useful in, in these scenarios specifically as, as we talked about different business, um, you know, uh, side and the tech stack. And yeah, I'm not sure what your experience with this is. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because it's, it's sort of like, you, you're calling me out uh, on my approach, which is which is true, and it's it's. I think it's the way that it needs to be. I think you need to get together people. They need to have discussions, even though I, I swear most of the time that people are complaining about, oh, we spend too much time on X, Y, Z. Um, but the alternative yeah. is worse. And I've <laughs> yes. I've worked in I've worked in those organizations where they're very siloed, and there are definitely fewer meetings, which is fine. Uh, on one hand, but on the other hand. There's so much double work, reinventing the wheel, uh, miscommunications and rework, and it's it's incredible. And I think, you know, we really need to approach the solution side, which is get them together, discuss, relate to people, you know, and hear it from other people, hear it two times, hear it ten times, and, and all of a sudden, inspiration and problems get solved. Yeah, I, I definitely like that approach. <laughs> and I think it works better in in spaces that are fragmented. So if you're, you know, maybe if you're in, I don't know, automotive, it's it's probably still beneficial if you're just doing, you know, not, not a great example, maybe something that's just very concrete, like uh, laying pavement, right? <laughs> Where you know it's pretty much the same. There are there are obviously things that vary, uh, especially on the surveying side, but for the most part, it's going to be a similar job each time. Probably gets less value from these interactions. But when you talk about things that are so fragmented and so diverse, you it's 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 a disaster waiting to happen if people are not talking. Yeah. Yeah, like trying to solve uh, maybe pollution or something like that. There's, you know, I see every day a new a new way to 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 solve uh, po pollution or something like that, and uh, it's very it's very interesting how there's so many different ideas around that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but yeah, then, then green, green energy. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. No, no, I said coming from that ideas then to the actual execution that, you know, it requires this kind of like um, team effort, right? And then alignment of that team uh, and understanding who's responsible for what. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of it is also playing into what Mark was mentioning earlier um, regarding not seeing uh, everyone as your competitor, but looking uh, at at other what other companies do and what uh, you know what's happening outside of your own area as potential partnership yeah actually i'm glad you, you said that because reflecting on that it's really coming down to the us versus them mentality because it's not just partner and um and competitor it, it's everywhere it's it's tech versus business it's my department mm -hmm. versus your department it's it's just us versus them and the number one way that i've seen break down this barrier and it's just 100 percent my experience is to get people to talk to each other you know i've been in situations where uh i was in a room with two people that that were not in, on the greatest terms with each other at a personal relationship level and they were both talking to me saying about them and them and them and them. Oh, well, he said this, and but talking to me, but talking to me. And it was like, yeah, yeah, guys, we're in the room together. We're having a conversation. You can talk to each other, you know. Um, but those, those emotional barriers are part of what's happening as well. And I think those emotional barriers happen uh, for a lot of reasons. They can happen for, um, I, don't, I don't know, I'm scared because I don't know what's going on. I'm afraid uh, or, you know, a lot of, lot of different reasons. But I think... Whatever those reasons are, we need to overcome those. And, and that's, again, uh, where I, I like the IoT Plus Network. We're hosting a variety of events. I have my own, which is a small scale, uh, you know, grab a, grab a drink and let's, let's talk. Uh, it, it, almost exactly like Ned had described, actually. <laughs> and he, he, hasn't, he hasn't been to, the, to one of these yet. And he knows how I run things. Uh, but there are other people, they have events too. They're... they're broader events there are more you know tech focused events there are more business focused events and i think that's really the goal of the network is let's get everyone talking let's get access to outsiders we, we invite oftentimes we'll invite outsiders investors government officials um what else have we uh, recruiters sometimes even though it, it, that recruiters is a great example of us versus them right what what do you guys when you get a message from a recruiter on LinkedIn, what's your first thought that goes to your mind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. an, eye, an eye roll usually ensues, yes. Yeah, they're people too. They're people too. And, you know, we, we invite them and all of a sudden they're talking and they're not trying to recruit you. You know, they're there on the terms that we set, of course, to join and share your experiences. They're there to talk and they have interesting things to say too. And it's, it's great. So if people want to uh, learn more about uh, this IoT Plus network, uh, how to get involved, how to join, more information about it, um, it looks like iotplus.network is the, is the URL, right? Yep, yep. And there's a couple things I wanted to point out there. So there's um, individual members and there are business members. And each has their own you know, positive uh, spin as to what you can get out of the network. I'm personally, I'm an individual member. And it's only 300 bucks a year. It's like any other professional uh, organization. Uh, and obviously, I get to do stuff like participate in podcasts, uh, get invited to speaking events. I've been asked just this month, I've been on three expert interviews. Just people ask me, can you uh, bump in and be an expert uh, interview? And of course, in that process, I'm networking and I'm, I'm giving them leads. I'm, I'm doing all this kind of uh, positive networking stuff. So as an individual member, you need to put something in to get something out. And, you know, whereas and individual members tend to be way more active in our network, it's not a big network yet. We're starting grassroots, super small, but um, then there are the, the business members and the business members, they can get a lot more benefits. There are um, services that the IOT plus network uh, sells. And what we do in the network, we have services and we have some, some folks that can fulfill those services, but the goal is really to get partners to contribute their services. So, and this is where I highly recommend that anyone listening to this, check out 
the types of services that are available because I think what we tend to do is I'm a company doing IoT and you know I'm going to do all of the IoT stuff. Well, you don't have to be McKinsey, right? There are other people in your network you can offload this to and even better, you can get some money by doing it, by signing up for some referral partnerships through the, the business um, membership accounts. So there's there's a lot of good stuff out there that we offer, and to sign up is super easy. We're as I said, we're small, so there's just an email address. I can provide that uh, link as well. Um, it's Falco. Uh, if you if you guys don't know Falco, he's uh, a presence in the IoT area globally, um, and yeah, he's he's the the chairman of the board. And you could also reach out to me directly in LinkedIn, and I can get you, get you started on whatever you need. So that's an excellent. Uh, Cool. Back of uh, the statement you made, I mean, you, you know, when you have a, a technical person and business person, have you had uh, much success where you had technical people from different department within the same company and the tech business department are coming together to complete a successful outcome project for IoT? Yeah, sometimes that's that's the goal. Sometimes a project is an outcome. Sometimes. Um, I, I can tell you, for example, we had a positive network effect. We call it the IoT Plus network effect, and that's our hashtag uh, that we're branding. But, um, you know, just introducing two people together, maybe it goes somewhere, maybe it doesn't. But we had one company, they were interested in um, selling software, and another is interested in creating hardware dev kits, and they're, they're getting paid to do that. Um, and just connecting those two people together, and all of a sudden their, their interests is sparked and they're talking and they want to do something forward and offer something to the market. So I think, you know, things like that, those are our success stories for us. And that's what we're after. We're, we're trying to find, because just, just imagine that that company goes off and, and says, Oh, you know what we really need is a, is a dev kit. And then three to six months later, five more engineers are hired. They're trying to make their own dev kit. Ah, that's, you don't need to do that in IOT, right? There's other people that are doing that. You can just, Find that person who's already, or th those people that are doing that, and be and benefit from that in your network. You mean there's IoT dev kits out there? <laughs> 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 yeah, but mine's different. Mine has to be specific to what I need. You know, that, that's always the, one of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's even though it's a dev kit, it has to be specific dev kit, right? <laughs> yeah. It always just starts kidding. with those hardware people. No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Hey, uh, do we want to open it up to comments and questions? I see. Uh, let's see. We do have, it uh, looks like we have Axel joining us again. Um, oh, Axel, nice. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me uh, open it up. If you'd like to, if you'd like to speak, you can um, ask any uh, questions or have any comments for, for Mark. Um Otherwise, yeah, uh, let's see. So uh, I'm looking at the site now. It, it looks great. There's, there's, um, there's IoT Plus services you mentioned, and uh, there's, there's quite, a, quite a few things you have here, like this IoT Plus business game, IoT Plus project planning, um, IoT Plus uh, data potential analysis, other things like that, sensors and software, which looks really great. Um, is this the, is this what you were talking about when you, you said you had different, uh, services available? Yeah, exactly. And some of them are, are handled through, uh, you know, just people who are freelancing that are in the network, but others, for example, the IOT plus innovation garage, that's actually through an IOT plus network, uh, corporate or business member. And that's, that is motion lab. Cool. So, you know, what we do is we just, we brand it, we push it and then it's available. And if people order through here then you know using the iot plus channels marketing channels we can be a referral partner for those uh for those members excellent excellent hey any other uh, questions from the group here alina syed nanad no not for my end i think it was a pretty cool <laughs> discussion so thank you mark for Joining us. Yeah, I think maybe yeah. maybe just uh, just from the uh, one remark is uh, I think we should uh, try to to kind of sum up in a positive note um, and maybe talk about some really successful um, IoT projects or projects in the IoT space. Some things done well. So Mark, maybe maybe you've got some some examples there. 
Yeah, yeah. I, the the one that comes to mind. So building a platform um, with a couple of companies, we made it work. Uh, it's it's live. You could see it today. And I love examples that are live because there's just so many examples of failed POCs or or not failed POCs. POCs that were successful, but then you know weren't picked up afterwards. Uh, the telematics uh, program that I worked on with with Dan Foss, and that was a great collaboration. We had. Again, we had the business people and the tech people all talking together. It was a fantastic um, project. It's it, nothing more than telematics for, for off-highway, so construction vehicles and things of this nature. And, of course, uh, AWS uh, was, was involved. <laughs> um, and the other projects are out there as well. I mean, where, where to begin? So, I mean, I've worked in projects where we've got uh, medical devices uh, blood gas analyzers are now connected to the internet thanks to iot um yeah. what else do those, have? those are those scenarios that actually just work right and this is the the hardest problem to achieve but yeah it, it is possible especially when you know those people get together and deliver right <laughs> yeah yeah and I, we also have medical buildings are connected with um back via backnet to Phoenix controllers, which is uh, thermostat control and and writing down or writing back to the system and um, controlling the the uh, the actuators valve valve controllers on the actuators and and what else? I mean, Laura, we have some leakage detect systems that are out there that are running that are helping folks like schools and campuses and and you know the Catholic Church avoid massive amounts of water damage and especially in these scenarios it might be a week before someone is aware of the leakage and all of a sudden you add a you know a few sensors you can stop this from happening and protect the asset from being destroyed in this case the building the infrastructure um yeah it, it, the list goes on but there are many that are live today real actual actually actually deployed which makes me so happy when that yeah. happens solving actual problems <laughs> Solving real world problems. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. That is Those actually, are great yes. examples. Yeah, I love that. I, I have a joke if we want to uh, do a, that just before the sign off here. Do tell. Which, uh, Please. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell one. If, if we don't get laughter, then I'll have to do a second one. Uh, <laughs> did, you, you did, you hear the one did, did you hear the joke about um, NQTT quality of service level zero? No. 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 Uh, yeah, you might you might not get it. Uh, oh yeah, bumped. right. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> I yes, like that yes, one. Yes, that's that's yep. <laughs> the last one I've got for you is how many AWS cloud developers does it take to change a light bulb? Uh oh, this could get dangerous. How many? <laughs> None. That's a hardware problem. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Of course, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, cool. Well, we are approaching the top of the hour, so I think um, it's about all the time we had. Um, hey, Mark, thanks a lot for, for joining us. This was a really fun uh, discussion, and thanks a lot for your insights on uh, data as a liability and telling us about IoT Plus Network and, uh, and other, um, other themes like your competitors, your best partner, et cetera. Um, really appreciate you having uh, having you here. So thanks a lot for joining. Yeah, thanks. It's been fun. All right. So uh, I think we'll um, we'll be back next week uh, as usual, same time. Uh, and until then, so long. Bye bye. Thank Cheers, you. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Cheers.